this is actually an honor for me. Um, yeah, Ben? Um, hi, everybody. I think this is only the second event I've attended in maybe 19 months, so it's a little, uh, it's, it's like I don't have training wheels. I still, I still have the training wheels on. So. He's always, always like sure. He's always like this. <laughs> just, just wind me up and okay. once I start get going. Cool. I can Isn't this you. technology great though? Uh, yes. So I'm kind of a Luddite, so I, I prefer to do like live, live screenings. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, for, uh, it, it's a great second option, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I have to give props to our audience, which has caught Oh, on. your tech is excellent. This is like the best tech I've seen for something like this. Oh. This is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're having fun, and uh, I think our audience has really enjoyed our monthly movie nights. So thank you for being our guest sure. tonight. Um, so I think before we, we show any trailers, um, maybe we could talk about how you got started in films because you started as a journalist and then decided to yeah. transition to film. Uh, so I was a journalist for about 25 years. I worked uh, in Asia for a little while and I worked in the US. And my last, I grew up in San Francisco. My last job was at the Chronicle and I was there for maybe 15 years, 10 or 15, somewhere. And they're offering these really good buyouts. The papers had merged. And uh, so I decided it was a good time to change uh, careers. So I, I took up the buyout package and I traveled for about a year. And I kind of figured out well, what am I going to do next? And um, I'd written a number of scripts that had never gotten made. So I figured, well, why don't I try and make a film? And our first film was uh, The Virtues of Corned Beef Hash. And it was sort of based on a short story that I'd written a few years earlier. Um, I'd been interviewing a bunch of war vets thinking I was going to do a vet, uh, book, but um, it turns out there were about 100 people doing uh, books about Japanese American war veterans at the same time, so it seemed kind of redundant. Uh, but I had a lot of great background uh, characters, and um, that's how the, the first film came about. And then the second film came about, uh, I wanted to kind of do a departure away from sort of uh, our history and do something that's kind of based more on our folklore and uh, Japanese kind of manga, anime, and these sort of traditions about spirits and ghosts. And that was Infinity and Chashi Ramen, and that's kind of how I've been. Well, it's how I've been. Um, one of our actors, uh, uh, left the production like literally a couple of days before shooting and we were like really desperate. I mean, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel and I found Ben. They had to be. Yeah, so anyway, ben, ben was a Facebook friend he, through Hiroshi and uh, he had posted a bunch of like arts and festival things. So I thought maybe he was an actor and I, I sent him an email or a text. And, um, if I recall correctly, you kind of turned me down the first time. You were hemming and hawing about it. And then you, your wife told you to do it? Uh, Am I remember my wife and daughter both told me to do it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. yeah. Is that the acting part or the, or the production? The acting. The part. acting. So he, he came into Japantown, and of course, everybody hits it. Everybody in the cast was either Asian American or Japanese American. So we all hit it off really well. and. Uh, so he took the gym of the part and um, later on I found he, he's actually uh, really great at camera work. And so now he's been working as our DP for the last two or three films, projects. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what was your first um, project as DP, a uh, director of photography? It was Puppies, Puppies, Puppies. Yeah, we were doing we a, a contest. Yeah, I remember that. I forgot about it. Wow, really well, that does not show up in your biography. Yeah, it's, it, should it shouldn't, not. it shouldn't. Um, there's like this, they do these like 72 hour film filmmaking contests. So on a lark, we, we did it and it was, it was pretty dreadful. Uh, I mean, we never done it. Puppies in it. So well, that was just one of the lines, was puppies, puppies, oh. puppies. And it was like, oh. 
so they feed you these three lines and you have to use them within it and hopefully all the all the, the video on that has been deleted uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty sure i've deleted it uh, ben, ben probably has one but i, I don't have the edited versions i just have clips oh good, good oh good. okay i'm sure there's one out there yeah i hope not <laughs> um yeah and then we we did a web series called Gold Mountain. It's a crime drama in San Francisco. And we did Kikon, uh, which we screened for you guys uh, a couple of years ago. Yep. And that's about it, I guess. That's mm -hmm. that. Okay. Well, this is a good time, I think, to show a couple of trailers. Um, sure. Just in case people have not watched um, these films, we thought we would share the trailers with you. Um, so we're going to show first the trailer for The Virtues of Corned Beef Hash, which was filmed mostly in um, San Francisco at May's beloved May's Coffee Shop, which is no longer yeah. no longer there. And then the second trailer is, we're going to show is Infinity and Shashu Dalman. So um, Justin, can we see those trailers? unfolds a little differently in San Francisco's Japantown. It moves at its own pace, to the beat of its own drum, guided in a way you couldn't possibly comprehend. Does her ticket have my name on it? Didn't spit in it. <laughs> this is Tenshi. He's a 400-year-old Japanese spirit with a foul mouth Baka. and a propensity for petty theft. And this is Lucy. I'm Lucy. Lucy Yamaguchi. She's having a really bad first day on the job. Together, these two unseen spirits will wander in and out of the lives of residents of this sleepy neighborhood. Wreaking <laughs> havoc. Hey, crackhead. As they try to keep the universe in order. When did you become a stalker? Oh, it's a new thing, yeah. You need more practice. I was about to mace your ass. They can't be seen, and they can't be heard. Oh, man. Eat faster. We're not going to get good seats. I bet you that crazy chick is already camped out there. I'm not doing it. But they can, and will, irreparably change and interconnect the lives of everyone they meet. The grand scheme of things is too complex for any one person truly comprehend. It's infinity. It's Joshu Ramen.
so uh, a couple, just quick thing. Uh, Kalan Ishimoto did the music for both of those. So he did the clarinet piece on uh, VCBH, and then he did the uh, the uh, Sanchin on uh, uh, Rami. How about on Kikan? Uh, no, we did. Uh, we did. A, we had Saki Kono, who is a jazz singer here in the East Bay, did the track on that. She did this great version of uh, When Johnny Comes Marching Home, but she sang it in Japanese, which was really, oh, really wow. nice. So um, I know when we were um, waiting to start and people were signing on to Zoom, mm -hmm. um, I was hearing some comments people were making about Infinity and Shashu Dalman. So feel free to type those into the chat and we'll also um, maybe open it up to the audience if, if um, time permitting and let well, you say your comments. Right now, I'm sorry. I there were so many people involved with that. Jason Liu uh, was uh, uh, the DP on uh, Chashi Rama. He, he sh shot some really striking stuff. Not nearly as good as Ben, of course. But it, it was really, really quite good. Well, um, I'd like to bring Ben in. So how was, how was the experience of acting in? Um, had you had any acting experience before? No, I haven't actually had a whole story about um, about this on uh, Discover Nikkei. So it's called The Accidental Actor. So if you want to hear the full story, just go to the Discover Nikkei, type in my name in the search, and one of those stories will be The Accidental Actor. <laughs> but um, nope, never acted before except in uh, Japanese school in eighth grade or something like that. <laughs> That's the, probably the last time I did any acting because they always put on the end of your play. Um, no, I just basically winged, winged it. Oh, really? Uh, Wait, was there a script or was a lot of oh, this improvised? It, no, there was a script. Yeah. There was a script, but my whole... I think my only advice to him was just play an old sound guy. That's <laughs> basically, <laughs> I played myself at like 10 years okay. old. So method acting? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Call that. <laughs> um, but but uh, one thing Hiroshi told me later, he said, oh, you were better than, you know, who's that other guy that you're in the scenes with? Who's that other guy? You were better than him. Wow. So uh, I don't know if he was, got me confused with the other guy, but because he couldn't remember the name or he was just telling me a story. So that's, I, I He's probably just trying to get free lunch. Uh, yeah, that's, there's a whole story. There's whole <laughs> stories about Hiroshi and, and lunch. Oh, yeah, but you can oh, tell okay. Story. Well, when we get to the Hiroshi section of our discussion, I want to hear these stories. Um, there's actually, um, I may even have a clip of Hiroshi where he's talking about. Actually, I do have a clip of Hiroshi where he was giving a reading in 2014 in Sacramento, uh -huh. and. Um, I made sure to ask him you know, about his experience on the in Infinity and Trashy Ramen. And he told a little story and then said, and we got to eat the props. <laughs> that was that was his the punchline for him. Got to, so there is a little element of um, food for Hiroshi. Well, a man after my own heart, because if you're gonna film a movie in San Francisco, Japan town, you gotta you gotta have yeah. the food, right? Yeah, in Japantown, um, we were playing uh, Remember When with Hiroshi while we were eating, and uh, it, somebody in the cast invariably knew one of the shopkeepers or somehow, or it was a cousin. So we got into literally any location we needed in, in Japantown. I've been Kyoto, opened their doors for us, and uh, we shot it on the bridge. Uh, we shot at, uh, they gave us pretty much carte blanche to shoot within the uh, Japan Center. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was really, the community really made it easy for us. It really did. Do you remember, I mean, I know this movie was made a while ago, but do you remember where the ramen place was? Um, it was weird because we beat the ramen craze. And there really, there were only a couple of ramen restaurants. So all the ramen we used was either made and delivered to us or we shot um, 
in pieces as cuttings. So there was a guy who owned a ramen restaurant on 28th and Clement, and we shot the interiors in there. That, that was one of the few scenes we didn't shoot. Oh, wow. But through camera chicory, it, it doesn't, like you wouldn't know that if you just watched it. No, absolutely right. not. It, I was trying to figure out which restaurant you were in. Yeah. But... Oh. And, I, and obviously, Ben Kyoto does not serve ramen, so it's kind of like... Uh, let's see, what have I had at Ben Kyoto? I think I've had hot dogs. Um, hot dogs, yeah, I was going to yeah. say grilled cheese, but... Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, just to remind people, in case they're they're saying, what was Ben in that movie? What was Ben doing in that movie? Um, I was, you played... I was... Uh, old guy, grumpy old guy number two. No. <laughs> you were a friend of... Um, the story about um, well, there's a story about uh, three, three, um, three old farts, three old farts from high school, uh, or three old guys who were friends in high school, um, and they meet up on the uh, Peace Plaza mm -hmm. and then walk into the mall, um, talk about golf for a little bit. And then have a little incident somewhere in the in the mall. Yeah, and then one of them um, who sort of uh, ignores a woman who's trying to be friendly with him, and then later on apologizes. Um, right? That's, yeah, he had met. So that character, I, I was going to mess up. It's Phil. Phil, you were. I'm Phil. Phil. You were Phil. Um, <laughs> God, now I can't Phil, remember. Jerry, and Stanley. And Stanley. Stanley is the... So Phil and Jerry are the two gay guys, but I never told them. Right. <laughs> so they're gay, but I never told them they were gay. Well, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. the, the golf and the hanging out together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I figured it out. Um, and then Stan was a widower, and he had gone out on a date with a woman, and he liked her but his head wasn't in the right space. So he treated her pretty badly when he met her in public. And uh, his son comes to visit and knocks some sense into him. So he goes back and falls just. So. Okay, so, uh, so Ben played the uh, second of the two guys who were friends of Stan's. Yeah. Okay, all right, just wanted to, I didn't want to get all these questions in the chat saying, which one was Ben? Yeah. Uh, well, there was Larry Moe and Curly when we were kicking our heads out. My, yes. My oh. Curly and the last one. Oh, that's a yeah. great, that was a great visual. Yeah. So, um, so how did you come up with the idea for um, Infinity and Chashu Dhamma? Um, so it's a lot of sort of vignettes sort of based on people I kind of grew up with. And um, there, it's an amalgamation, of course. It's not like specific people. And I wrote it originally to serve all these intersecting lives and the way people are connected, even though they don't know it. And my first my first run through it, it actually didn't have the spirits. It didn't have uh, Tenshi or Lucy. And I liked the script enough, but it didn't really have the, um, it, it didn't seem to have the heart I wanted to, to put into it. And I was actually talking to Hiroshi and, um, about him and, uh, I think I'd asked him if he spoke Japanese and he said he was pretty fluent. And so that kind of got my, my, my head rolling in it. And so the woman who plays Lucy, uh, so they came with the two spirits and one was uh, one from the old country and then Lucy was represented the sort of Japanese Americans. And uh, I always kid Wendy, to, she was a really wonderful actress um, that uh, she only got the role because she fit the dress. So, <laughs> so that dress was actually from the 40s and uh, was our costume designers. So the dress came first and then? The dress came first and then when he, when he came second. Wow. Um, yeah, if anybody has any favorite stories, because it's, it's a, they're very, um, they're very different stories, each one, you know, and somehow they get sort of resolved at the end. So if anybody has any favorite stories, put those in the chat too. Love to find out which ones uh, people people like, and I know Alan thought that there was a love story going on, mm -hmm. um, which we decided was between the stalker and, <laughs> <laughs> and 
um, the sort of old uh, high school or yeah. girlfriend, and they were getting back together. Again. Yeah, they met uh, sort of randomly. Well, they were actually cool. They met because of the two spirits. But Todd's also a Japan town. Todd, Todd, uh, Todd Nakagawa, mm -hmm. also a, a Japan town boy. And he actually worked at Ben Kyoto when he was a kid. So um, he kind of helped us get into. He, he talked to Bobby, and that kind of opened the door for us. Mm -hmm. So I remember we were shooting on a Sunday. This is sorry, it's a quick story. Yeah. Um, so we're shooting. They, they're closed on Sundays, so we went really early in the morning, like six a.m. So Bobby comes down, they, there's an apartment upstairs. Bobby comes down, he opens the door and we start moving stuff in and he gives me the keys and he goes, just just leave them in the mailbox when you're done. And I was like, you know, like literally he's trusting us with his own livelihood. Um, but it was, it was really nice of him to do that. So. Wow, so um, was there actually any um, manju in the display cases? Oh, there wasn't. It was Sunday, so they didn't. They didn't have. They don't. They're not open Sunday, so they didn't. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Ben, did you have something you wanted to? I just was reading that question. Oh, oh there is. Can, it's about Randall. Can you read it? <laughs> I was shocked to see Randall Nakano starring in your film. I hadn't seen it since he was about ten years old. I guess at church. Anyway, maybe you could explain how the woman in the bed was able to see the spirit in the red dress. Also was a woman in red, a relative of this woman. Her picture was on her vest. Oh, the Chizu Omori. Yeah, Chizu, oh, Chizu, I love Chizu. Um, Chizu out there? No. Oh, oh man. I know. She, she never answers her emails. Um, <laughs> so I love Chizu because, like I go, hey Chizu, I got this part in the movie. You, you want to do it? And she'll say no. <laughs> I'll, I'll call her over. I got a part in the movie, you want to do it? And I go, Cheesy, you want to have lunch? And she goes, yeah, we'll have lunch. So we grab lunch. And Cheesy, so we'll eat lunch. And Cheesy, you want to do the part in the movie? Yeah, I'll do it. Oh. So, so was it just, you know, she... Yeah, I don't know. Is it like old people that just want lunch? No, it's, like, it's, it's lunch. <laughs> you know, usually lunch may be dinner also. Yeah. Um, we don't eat that much at our age. I can relate. I can relate. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The question. Um, so, if you you're paying really close attention early on, uh, Lucy talks about her sister Rose, mm -hmm. and um, so um, part of part of the the loop on Lucy's story is that she gets to meet her sister again, but it's 60 years later. So her younger sister's now 90, and that's why the pictures on the the frame. And at the very end of that scene, um, Hiroshi goes, it's time to go. And he's not really talking to Lucy, he's talking to, to, to Rosie that it's time for her to, to pass away. So that's why they can see the spirits, mm -hmm. or she can see the spirits. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. very moving. And we shot that at Kokoro. Um, oh. They're really nice to let, let us shoot there. Kirk Miyataki mm -hmm. and uh, Jimmy, can't remember Jimmy's last name, sorry. But they're they're really generous in the there. Well, I'm glad you mentioned all this because one of the things not only do not only are your films enjoyable as stories and storytelling, but you're also documenting, you're chronicling SF Japan town. Mm -hmm. You know, you're showing a life that is fading pretty fast. Um, like for example, uh, Ben Kyoto. Uh, I think we should talk about that because that's an important thing. But also, um, I noticed in Kikan, I think you have Yasukochi yeah. in there, right? So it's it's really important that these things are being shown. Um, you know, the the general public doesn't know that they're around or exist, and they don't know that they're disappearing. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, well, again, Hiroshi, we were just talking about we way back when, and. Um, it was like connect the dots of all these businesses that used to be there and have changed ownership. Like uh, he worked at Soko, and you know, if you go to Soko Hardware, like I always had a question to the the escalator work. It was like in the twenty years I was going in there, it was never running. And, and Hiroshi, of course, says it does work, but he used it just for the older people. Um, 
and you know we couldn't figure out where marinas was and um you know it's like stepping back it's every generation has these sort of spots and obviously everyone probably knows being Kyoto is going to be closing at the end of the year and um, may's coffee shop where we shot corned beef hash uh, closed three years ago uh, oh and, and thank you don and cliff if you're out there for letting shoot there um so you know it's not an intentional documentation of history but you're right when i go back and i look at these films i see things that are just you know have just gone away um and it kind of breaks your heart because you know these things you grew up with when you're a kid um you know like, like ben kyoto is a massive loss because it's like you know there's a peace pagoda there's a peace pot in the japan center and then there's ben kyoto and it's like uh, that was just always an identifiable piece of Japan town. So I hope somebody buys it and mm -hmm. keeps it going. That would be nice. So Alan has a comment. He said, I love the shots of Japan town filmed with a lot of love and appreciation. Yeah. So Jason Liu, he's down living down in LA now. Um, we would have lunch and um, <laughs> we would talk about sort of like how we wanted to make the film look. And I kept saying, well, I want to make it a, a Valentine to the neighborhood. You know, I want these sort of lush colors and um, these nice crushed blacks. And um, each of the scenes, if you notice them, like um, there's an angry girl at, the, at New People's Cinema. There's always, the walls are always orange. So there's, there's that feel. And then if you look at Anna, um, the two, the two, the one kid speaking Spanish and, She's speaking Japanese, but they somehow communicate. That's always shot in blue. Um, so we wanted to keep sort of this color motif going. And he, he just did an amazing job on it. And we talked about movies we liked. And like, like there's a John Ford movie called The Quiet Man. I know, I know. Uh, John Wayne's in it. Um, and he goes back to Ireland. And if you watch the film, it, the way it was shot is just, it's just wonderful. These colors are so um it, it's like they're otherworldly color it's not like their colors are so bright they're not found in nature and that's kind of what we wanted wanted to do with japan town um well thank you for for shooting it as beautifully sure. as we did um and did you say that you wanted to try to work on a project about ben kyoto um i i it, I've been kind of kicking around. I'd like to do something. I'm just not sure what it would be because, um, you know, I'm a little worried there's going to be a, another COVID quarantine and there are, you know, if they shut down for two more months, you know, they, they may not reopen. So it's sort of, it, you know, it's what you do. No, I mean, time. I guess you're, you're really impacted by the lockdown because uh, it really impedes um, shooting or any kind of movement, right? Yeah, we had uh, had a few screenings set up for our last one, GeekCon, but the COVID hit and we weren't able to do that. And then we've had a couple of false starts on our next project. Mm. Can we talk a little bit about that? Like um, GeekCon and then also the the movie that you'd like to make uh, as sort of a sequel to GeekCon? Uh, sure. Have we, did I answer the question? Oh. I can't remember if I answered the last about, question. Did yes, I? I think so. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm droning on, I'm starting to lose focus. Um, so Kikon, uh, you made a, a good point. It's like we made a reference to the sweet stuff because I love crunch cake there. <laughs> it was kind of like, um, Moses and Hatsy had been there, you know, I guess since the seventies, since I was a kid. Do you, do you remember? Yeah, of course. And, um, so that was the reason for that. And there's a couple of other little sort of Japan town references within it. Um, so that, that one, we shot kind of out of, really out of order. We shot Hiroshi's, the, the final sequence first, and then we shot the other sequences. I think we shot the, did we shoot the war sequence or the table sequence first? They're pretty close together. I think we shot the, the, the table sequence first. Table and then the war. And then the port. On subsequent yeah. weekends. Right. 
Um, yeah, so we, boy, it's really dragging on here. So Hiroshi and I would, had been talking about doing a play and we had, uh, we'd been going through readings on it and it was the terrible third act. Um, and somewhere, you know, maybe our third or fourth reading on it, Hiroshi was, um, and, and Hiroshi, great actor and he's total professional. And uh, he, he dropped me an email and he said he wasn't gonna be able to do it because he's having problems hearing for one thing and, and also his memory's going. Um, but he also mentioned he wanted to do another film. You know, he said something like, if you have another film role, I'd be happy to do that. So that was sort of the genesis for Keycon. So, and we shot that first. And the it, Keycon is part of a much larger story. And we felt that that was sort of the best short I could make that would also have a part for Hiroshi in it. And so we wanted, so we're now kind of thinking about doing the full movie, which is about two families during the war, one from the city and one from the valley. And sort of how, it's a little bit like ICR because it's about all these lives kind of intersect, um, you know, how, how they intersect both within the camps, within the war. Uh, there's a big sequence about a no-no boy who um, a lot of it is Hiroshi's in that. Um, and sort of how after the war, the community comes back together, but it comes back together a little bit disjointed. And, um, you know, it, it, it's still a struggle to um, continue on. So that was, that's sort of the full movie. But again, it's like we want to do that, but we're running into problems with COVID and shooting schedules. And the original cast is like, they're all young, so they've all moved to LA. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's gotten a bit tricky. But did you always know that Kikon was going to be a, a short? Or, um... No, it was originally part of the, the bigger okay. script. Okay. We, we cut it out specifically because it worked okay. as a short mm -hmm. better than the other sequences. So this um, longer movie that I hope you get to make um, is Kintsu Kudoi, is that a working title or are you pretty sure? Um, I'm pretty sure that's going to be it. So that's uh, one of our actors is a potter. And I was talking to her about it. And so there's a Kintsugi, which is the, the way a broken pottery is put together using a gold, um, which are bonding. So you have this cracked vase, but with the bonding there, it looks really kind of pretty. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kintsukuro is more of a the philosophy of that. It's sort of how broken, um, how you find beauty in something that's broken. And I, I, I felt that was a really good metaphor for the Japanese American community at that, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So um, will our, our Ryan Takemiya get to be in this next one, you think? Uh, if he gets a haircut, <laughs> have you seen him? He's got hair down to here. I'm like, what, what the hell, man? Um, yeah, Ryan will be in it. Uh, yeah, I'll take him to lunch. Oh, no, you don't want to take Ryan to lunch. Yeah, no, the guy, he's like, the guy, like, eat me on a the budget. So. Uh, he didn't eat JJ out of, uh, yeah. No, nah, he's just being polite around right. you guys. Oh, my God. So, if you notice, um, Ryan's in every, almost every scene, he's eating something. If you look at Gold Mountain, the web series we did, he's eating something. It just seems constant. Yeah, it's kind of a okay. running gag. So that is also and a kind of method acting, right? That's yeah. Ryan I think Ryan. he was just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I think for the scene, the the dinner scene in Kikai, he starved himself that day. Yeah. He didn't eat the whole day just so he would be hungry. Um, that's he, method. He is eating. That's yeah. He is eating in that scene, right? Yes, that's wow. method because he was just. Yeah, and again during that scene when you ate the props. Well, yeah, I mean, don't you usually have to treat the food to look a certain way on film? Or those, that was real food. That was real food. We made a food run and just kind of shot it. Wow, it showed up great on film. Um, yeah, I guess he did. Definitely he shot so. it. I don't know. 
Well, lots of colors. <laughs> right. If you use, if there were lots of colors in there. So. Yeah, so with, with that scene specifically, we shot it in a really dark, a uh, friend of ours, uh, Sander, has a really dark, it's a 1930s building and it's a really dark dining room. And it worked out really well because it created this great sort of like, uh, you know, it's a dark brown and it sort of was this sort of like claustrophobic thing. And then the food mm -hmm. and the acting kind of made it feel like home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It worked out really nicely. I think this Japanese food is just, or Japanese American food is just naturally photogenic, right? It made me hungry. I mean, yeah. every time I see Japanese food on right. on film, I immediately get hungry. Yeah, and Chizu, of course, stole the scene. Yeah. <laughs> did you tell her to do, or did she, uh, was she speaking from script or did she? Yeah, it was all scripted. Um, so the, the weird thing about it was that during rehearsal, she kept botching the Japanese. It was just terrible. And it was just kind of like, so we're thinking about, okay, so we're going to shoot it um, by piece. Like, um, it, I don't know if we should tell the story, but so she, we were doing the lines and she, she, she botched it and she just like, God damn it. And it was really funny because it's cheesy and you're like, what? Um, so she's having trouble and having trouble and we're just like, well, we're going to shoot, shoot it line by line, uh, which is a little more difficult, but, but very doable. And she nails it. She like literally nailed it on the first take. And we're just like, wow. Um, uh, yeah, and she was, you know, obviously, she, she would joke that it's, again, not a stretch for her. She's a little adult. So. But she's wonderful. She's yeah. so wonderful. She was terrific in that scene. Yeah. Um, well, let's, why don't we show um, Ben's videos um, yeah. so we can segue to our um, second part of our discussion tonight to talk about Hiroshi, since we've already brought him up a few times to talk about the films. Um, so we will show a couple of um, films. We'll show a meeting at Tule Lake, followed by, um, I think it's called Art History. No, The, the Artist. The, oh, The Artist, the artist. sorry, The Artist. Um, and that shows you a couple of different facets of Hiroshi. So do you wanna um, tee it up and talk about it before we show it? So the, let me talk about the second one. Okay. The, the artist, it's um, one of the things I wanted to do when I was interviewing Hiroshi was find people that knew him to talk about him. And I would ask him, well, Hiroshi, who, who do you know that you would want me to interview? And he would hem and haw a lot about, <laughs> you know, that everybody's so old. So I kept, at, at some point, I, maybe I asked him about his art, and he, he said something about Wendy, uh, Wendy Yoshimura, who's his art instructor. And we had shot, uh, Curran, and, Curran and I had shot um, one class that he had been in a few years earlier. So it some, somehow that brought it up. And he wanted to go visit Wendy because he hadn't been to class in a while, yeah. or he had stopped going to art class. So he was very excited, and that's, um, that sort of set up the whole meeting with uh, Wendy in her uh, studio in Oakland. Mm -hmm. The uh, the um, a meeting at Tule Lake is um, uh, Hiroshi and a bunch of us in Infinity and Trashy Wellman went to Bainbridge Island in Bainbridge, outside of Seattle. And it, as part of that, he did a reading in the Luke, Luke Wing. Wing Luke or Wing Luke? Wing Luke. He did a reading in the, the museum of, of various poems and stories that he'd written. And one of those was a meeting at Tule Lake. I captured that. I had no idea what to do with it. So at some point during my interviews with Hiroshi, um, I had this idea. And, uh, I, and I think actually it was. Um, it was because Hiroshi Himizu, Shimizu uh, sat with uh, Hiroshi to have a meeting or to be interviewed together. And in that, um, in that interview, Hiroshi Shimizu says something about the poem, about its significance. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I think that, I think, 
know, it's hard to remember exactly, but that kind of was the, the seed for putting together um, the meeting at two, or meeting at two week length. Great, thank you. So we're gonna show both of them back to back. Um, um, a meeting at Tule Lake is about 15 minutes long, and the artist is about uh, a little over eight minutes long. And then after that, we're gonna bring um, Kerwin and Ben back, and we're gonna add um, um, Sadako and Hiroshi to talk about, um, about Hiroshi. Okay, so let's watch those two videos. His name is Hiroshi Kashiwaki. My name is Hiroshi Shimizu, and I've been uh, working on the pilgrimages since uh, 1996 and I went to my first Tule Lake pilgrimage in 1994. I think it was probably around 96, 98 or so when I first met Hiroshi. What I knew most about him was that he was the author of uh, The Meeting at Tule Lake and uh, how That poem seemed to uh, capture what Thule was like for those who were incarcerated there and uh, what that experience came to mean uh, in the present time. He uh, brings out the, uh, uh, the no-no memory and uh, and from that time on, he was the first and uh, most vocal person to uh, come out as a no-no. And so he's you know, really important to the Thule Lake Committee, but also to the general Japanese American community as uh, someone that understood from the very beginning that it was not something to be ashamed of, but something to be proud of. And uh, that's been kind of what the pilgrimage has been about for the last uh, 20 years. To bring out the fact that people that protested their incarceration uh, were being totally American and uh, totally brave about it. And it was not something to be ashamed of. So Hiroshi has stood as a beacon for that, that bravery and declaration. So, uh, you know, to us, He's a, a real hero, maybe our first hero. 30 years after coming out of camp, I was invited to attend the second Tule Lake pilgrimage in 1975. We left after work in the evening, so most of the bus ride was after dark. Most of the uh, people on the bus were young, young students, college, mainly college students. And uh, there were a lot of non-agents on the bus as well. As the bus took off, I started to write. Words came quickly and easily. We rode uh, all night. So it was a matter of uh, six to seven hours. And during that time I was writing in, in the darkness of the bus. Years later, I realized that the 
there was a kind of a rhythm of the bus in, in the poem. The bus ride to Tuli Lake in the night over dark highways, rain through the flatlands, and snow beyond weed, up, up to the root of California, was a movement back in time, back to the years 1943, 44, and 45, when I was 19, 20, and 21. Being among you, sensing your youthfulness, hearing your strong voices, I search for reasons why I came after 30 some years. Tuli Lake, Tuli Lake, that was a name I dared not mention, spoken rarely, always with hesitation, never voluntarily, but you have made it a common name again of a small sleepy town that it was before we came here before we were confined here before it became Tuli Lake Relocation Center before it became Tuli Lake Segregation Center for disloyal Japanese Americans when we got to Tuli Lake Everyone had their own uh, sleeping bag, which they unrolled on the floor. And we stayed at the fairgrounds. I, I didn't have a sleeping bag <laughs> anyway, so I sat and uh, I made a second copy of the poem. So around nine o'clock, we had a poem uh, program. I had a speech ready, so I gave my speech, and then I read the poem. It's right that we're here to see firsthand where 18,000 of us live for three years or more, to see again the barbed wire fence, the guard towers, the MPs, the machine guns, bayonets and tanks, the barracks, the mess halls, the shower rooms and latrines. Yes, it's right to feel the bitter cold of those severe winters, the warmth of the pot-bellied stove and the dust storms. How can we forget the sand biting into our skin, filling our eyes and nose and mouth and ears Graying our hair in an instant. Yes, it's right to recall the directives of the War Relocation Authority. Their threats and lies. The meetings, the strikes, the resistance, arrests, stockades, violence, attacks, murder, derangement, pain, grief, separation, departure, informers, recriminations, disagreements, loyalty, disloyalty, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, ise, nise, kibe. These are words now, but they were lived here. I guess I was thinking back to how it was, you know, well, we were there. Because I, I give a good picture of the life of being in camp. And uh, as I said, I, the politics side, there isn't, I don't think I was concerned with that. Um, but it creeps in. my attitude toward the administration at some points you know, is revealed in the poem. And the, my attitude toward the, how the government treated us also comes out in the poem. Uh, but I guess I was writing 
to an audience of young students going back to Tulaneg and uh, experiencing, or for us, re-experiencing with them, with these young people. And in a way, I was trying to tell them what camp was like. There were deaths and births and love making in the fire break with the warden's flashlight shining on you. Yes, and movies, socials, dances, sports, card games, and religion. Sewing classes, flower arrangement, doll making, wood carving, beauty behind barbed wires. Recreation was big, it was encouraged. Keep them busy, keep them occupied, keep them sane for heaven's sake. But a chronicle reporter observed, there are 18,000 mental patients living in confinement at Tui Lake. So it is right that I remember and tell it I wish I could share the feeling I have now with the Issei and Nisei, they who lived here, they who do not speak of it, who pass it off as a good time experience. Through the years, you know, you be, begin to realize what really, the, what the government did to us and how I reacted and and the, the uh, difficulties I had because of the limitations that the government had placed on us. And uh, you wondered who, if, if I had been responsible for it, or was it the government? And uh, as time went on, I realized that it, what we were victims. And so, uh, should call it what it was and we were imprisoned and against our will and uh, so we began to assert our rights and, and then we were wronged as citizens and uh, as time went on I became bolder to speak out the truth of what really happened. Whatever we did here, the commitments we made, loyal or disloyal, compliance or resistance, yes or no, it was right. Because the young people make it so, because they seek the history from those of us who lived it, so we must remember and tell it. We must acknowledge it and tell it. So we are here. The Adelone Mountain, the Castle Rock, the dry lake bed, where trees still grow. But the barracks, where are the barracks? And where apartment 4005D, home once long ago, so Demolished? Gone. Little remains, except what's trapped in our heads, far back somewhere. I'm glad I made this trip. Somehow I feel a meeting of youths. Your youth, your energy, your enthusiasm, your sense of justice. With the youth that I was, idealistic, intense, angry. It's a happy meeting. It's even better that I can, that I can stand aside for 30 odd years and see it. This meeting to meet, to share, to learn, to struggle, to continue. I sense an immense feeling of continuity with you, all of you. Yes, it's right. It's right, and I'm glad I came 
that Tutu Hile with you. is a poet, a playwright, a very gifted actor of the screen and stage. His name is Hiroshi Kashiwa. She was not too intrusive. She would show us exactly what we should be doing. And individually, she gave these instructions. She said that everyone has his or, or her own style. You do such a great job. You really do. You don't know yet, huh? Do you? No. You know? You know, you, you do the kind of work that, you know, especially the one that we do in the classes, you know. Yeah. You show it to me, and I know it's yours. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh. You know, I recognize this. Ah, that's your Russian. You know, Sometimes like, I, I think I'm lazy. No, no, it's not. No. No. Why? Why you say lazy? Well, I don't know. You know, I see the other students, they take their... Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's just it's just a different style. You oh, just kind of oh. you just really catch the feel of that flower, you know, uh -huh. and you just do it. It's so good. Oh, you, you really, yeah. I feel sort like of. I in, might be cheating. No, 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 no. 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 You know, I go to the market, not market, but, you know, Trader Joe's and pick the, you know, flowers, you know, for them to paint. And I remember this, and he just captured it so well. He just, I, I just love the way he did it. Just, he got it. Feel of that plant. Uh, yeah, you do. I love it. You know, compared to mine, not, you know, mine is all anal, you know, really detail and all that, but you just got it, like, you know, choo, 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 you know, it's like, he has a flower, you know, flower, just put in the yellow, you know, or it's like, mine would be, you know, petal by petal, you know, it's really, really nice, I love it. He improved so fast, he became familiar with the watercolor so fast. And he had his own style, you know, that I could recognize, you know. I got my BA in Asian languages. I wanted to continue in graduate school, but UCLA didn't have graduate courses. So I decided I would transfer to Berkeley. So I came to Berkeley in September 1952 and I was interviewed by one of the advisors and they said, oh, well, you have to repeat this course and this course. So he said, I would have to repeat the course that I had passed in, in UCLA. So I had an artist friend, a painter, Compressigio. And he and I used to talk about art. He would have a studio somewhere. Yeah. And 
when I go visit him in his uh, apartment or something. Then there'll be a notice that I'm at the studio. Oh, <laughs> so, so you will go. be upstairs. Uh -huh. And I had to throw a coin against the window <laughs> to get his attention. Yeah, because he's painting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember visiting him that way. I see. But we were very good, close friends. And so I was convinced that I should switch majors. Oh, because of him. Uh, yeah, oh. we, we would talk about art. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. And so I did. Oh. And I was starting fresh. Oh. I not added maybe one course in art, art history at UCLA. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I had to spend a whole year, you know, with the undergraduate courses. And then my second year, I was doing seven hours. So I had to watch all the slides. Yeah, yeah, that's why you knew all the yeah, <laughs> yeah. sketch the sketch them. Yeah, yeah. We sit in the dark and watch the slides <laughs> and then sketch. So we could remember. So you have to pick up some <laughs> outstanding peculiarity oh, in the, the it, work. It was so competitive. Oh, it's yours? And you you went to make, Cal, so You yeah. had to maintain a piece. Oh. And somehow, yeah, I would pass the test. Yeah. And then I had to take some drawing classes. Oh. And we classes. started in the Greek. <laughs> oh, God. I don't know if we had Roman. We sure had a lot of Greek. Greek. <laughs> yeah. And then the Renaissance. Renaissance. And then later, I don't know whether I had the, the impressions, but I I just like that. Yeah. So I picked it up on my yeah, own. Yeah. On your own. Yeah. yeah. I really like impressionism, the French impressionists. I'm sure that that has influenced me. I had a course in. in drawing and then charcoal drawing so that was the extent of my art uh, training and I think that's where I picked up the painting technique uh, the idea of composition and how painting is done I really enjoy doing it in a way I, it's easier for me it seems almost than writing writing takes it seems a little more effort although in different in different way but uh, at this point I find uh, painting uh, very very good for me come on Toby <laughs> what a nice dog. Yeah, he's a pretty good dog. <laughs> so what's this one? Our other guests from if you don't mind moving to the outside chairs. <laughs> Sorry, we've got the air conditioner on full blast. Yeah. And what's cool. Thank you all for joining us. So I really don't even know where to start because I never I never know how to oh so I got a story for you. Okay. You want to can everybody hear? I just want to make sure everybody can hear us. Okay. So the, there's food, there's a food story in this. Okay. Um, at the very beginning of the, the artist, Hiroshi and I are in the car driving. So 
the meeting with Wendy was sometime in the afternoon. But Hiroshi said, no, no, come early, come early, because he wanted to go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we went to lunch before we, we went to, um, to, to see Wendy. Were you driving? Yes. So who was taking the picture from the back? Or who was uh, I, had a, I had a camera set up. Oh. Um, on a on an arm connected to the uh, the headrest, <laughs> and so I was able to get that. There's also um, as as part of that. There's I did a takeoff on streets of San Francisco with Hiroshi. <laughs> so as we're driving, as we're driving, I put together a, a short clip of of Hiroshi as we're driving out of San Francisco, into San Francisco, through neighborhoods, to the, the streets of San Francisco theme. So, oh, my God. Unfortunately, because it's copyrighted, I can't really. You can't use the music? Um, YouTube slaps a oh. violation. And I don't really want to, I could probably put it on Vimeo, but I don't want to, it, it is copyrighted music. I don't want to use that without oh. you know, actually having paid for it. Yeah, that never stops me. Yeah, I mean, you're among well, friends. You're among 80 of your closest friends. Just go ahead and send it to us. Um, I think it's on Facebook. I'll okay. Look. Okay. Look. I would love to see that. So, again, there's a food component to having it. Love it. I mean, that's what being Japanese American is about, I think, right? The food. Where did you go? Do you remember? Um, not exactly. It was a Japanese restaurant, maybe 15 minutes away. Of I'm not even sure what it was. Food was good though. <laughs> uh, I, 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 we went to lunch one time at uh, Volcano Curry, which is at like around 26, maybe in Geary. And uh, well, we met there, we were chatting a little bit, and Hiroshi had mentioned his gout was acting up. And I'm like, dude, should you be eating curry? And he's like, kind of just doesn't answer. So he orders like the katsu curry. And, uh, I'm a pretty big guy, but he like, he was done before I was. He was like, just, just going at it. And so we talked a little when we leave. Now, if you know where Volcano Curry is, you know that Joe's ice cream parlor is about four doors down. So we walk by and I'm walking to the bus stop and um, he stops and I'm just kind of like, you know, and I look at him and he's like, you know, he looks in the ice cream store. So we went and had ice cream and we're leaving. So we're eating ice cream after the curry. And I'm like, Gus, the doctor's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, she finds out. <laughs> so is it true, Sadako, did Hiroshi have a really good appetite? Oh, yeah. <laughs> did Who was the cook in the family? Was it you or was it? You no, know, I was mainly a cook. He, he had some, did some cooking. Mm -hmm. And he liked his uh, rice. He said my rice was, was off. He said your rice was yeah, off? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I said, okay, you complain, you cook it. <laughs> <laughs> so he started cooking the rice. <laughs> wow. I wonder why it was off. Hmm. Did he have favorite dishes that you made? Hmm. He likes spaghetti. <laughs> what? Wait, yeah. with gohan or without gohan? Without gohan. Okay. okay. And apple pie. Oh. oh, yeah, apple pie. He liked apple pie. So apple pie yeah. was his favorite? Yeah. This gives me a good uh, excuse to thank Amy and Fuzzy and um, Yuki and Haruko for making the apple dessert, which was in honor of Hiroshi tonight. Thank you. <laughs> also, the curry dish was also really good tonight too so thank you chef eugene um you know one thing that uh, i was sort of noticing when i was watching the artist was that um hiroshi talked about um studying it was called oriental languages at the time asian languages at ucla he wanted to get a master's degree but berkeley didn't have such a program and how he took art history classes or he started to practice art, but he actually did attend UC Berkeley to get a, a master's degree in library science. That was later. Oh, that was later? 
Oh, do you know what made him think about pursuing uh, being a librarian? Long story. <laughs> <laughs> we have time? Well, he, he worked for the Buddhist Churches of America for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And then, meanwhile, we got married, and got married, and we had three children, and you know, budget was kind of tight. So we decided he had to pursue something else. And so we, we moved to to um, San, Fr San Francisco, and then we went to this uh, special school, and he met this man there who was a librarian. And he said, you know, with your background, why don't you become a librarian? So. That's how he became a librarian. Wow. But the interesting thing about this was Mr. Marshall had been a prisoner of war, Japanese prisoner of war. And yet, you know, he was very generous about uh, getting Hiroshi involved. And that's how, and the story, it's, it's too bad he didn't just had, um, hadn't said before because now he had to commute. Oh, back to Berkeley. Back to Berkeley. Oh. And he commuted for 18 months, I guess it was. And yeah. completed the, um, that's how he became a librarian. Okay. And then meanwhile, you took care of the boys? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you mind my asking how the two of you met? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. He told me this. It's a great story. Well, actually, you know, he was a block manager in Block 40, and I had a friend there, and I lived in Block 45. So he was a block manager, and I was what? He was Block 20, and I was 10. And I would run by there, you know, um, to visit my friend. <laughs> and he noticed me at that time, and, you know, 20 years, 10 years different. I wouldn't know where I would have this. So then I, I, I get to Berkeley after I get a job and I go to the Buddhist church and we get to talking and lo and behold, you know, we find out we're from the same area. You know, he's, he was from Lewis and I was from Newcastle, which was another seven miles up the road. Mm -hmm. And, but because of our, our age difference, uh, we didn't know the same people, but we had the same background. So mm -hmm. that was close. Wow, so you met when you were 10? Well, yeah, yeah. Right. Wow. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> wow. wow, that is a long time romance. That's a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I used to tease your dad about that all the time. <laughs> That's 10, man, dude. No. <laughs> um, well, does anybody have memories of Hiroshi as a librarian? He was quite oh. the legend at SF. Uh, PL in the Western edition. I do. Um, so uh, when we were casting Corn Beef Hash, we, we had set a shoot date and we were getting really close to it. We hadn't found an actor yet. And Hiroshi's name came up. We were, we were talking about it and he said, yeah, it'd be perfect. And we didn't know how to contact him. So somehow I got an email address that turned out to be hmm. Hiroshi's, Hiroshi Jr.'s email. So I emailed him and he goes, I got an email back and he goes, well, I'm not the actor, but I'll love my dad. <laughs> and so, you know, I sent his dad the script and he came on board. So we met for lunch again <laughs> in Japantown. And, uh, you know, and of course I, I knew, knew of Hiroshi before that. And I always, you know, there's this tendency to like, make people larger than life. And um, so I'm thinking he's like this, like, uh, I, I don't know, like, you know, you kind of put people up on these, these pedestals and you don't really think of them as people, you think of some, something bigger and because of his activism. Um, so we started chatting and um, uh, we, we hit it off and it turns out he's running a Western Edition library and I was kind of a latchkey kid and I was going and spending the afternoons at the library. And we're kind of looking at each other. I go like, you know, and, and the time frame overlapped. And I'm just sort of like, you know, we, but, but we couldn't remember each other. We just, we just, 
you know, I'm sure we bumped into each other. But he was literally my librarian when I was a kid. So. Wow. Wow. Anybody else have any memories of Kidoshi growing up with your dad? Um, I don't know. I, I, I got a sense when I was a kid that he, he didn't like being a librarian too much. I think he said later on that he liked it. But he'd come home and he would, you know, we'd sit around. That's when people sat around the, the table to eat. Do you remember that? <laughs> he would just complain and complain. And go, oh my God, he must not like his job too much. But I think it was that specific situation that he was in and later on in his career as he yeah, I, got better. I, yeah, well, I have a story about that. He had this uh, supervisor that he didn't like. And so, but of course, he didn't confront her directly. But one day, she, they really had it, and he was really angry. And so she had a, a potted plant on the desk, and it was all wilted. And he got angry and just threw it in the rice paper basket. And that story circulated around the library, and it's still told me. Wow. <laughs> She got the she got the message. She was nicer. Okay, he didn't get in trouble. Oh. And then after that, I mean, that was why he was complaining because it was that particular situation. Okay. But on the whole, he really enjoyed his job. Oh, well, that's nice. So I think it'd be great. Years later, she actually went to library school herself. I so thought so. We we're, were all grown. She was in her fifties, and she moved from San Francisco to Berkeley. She lived with my dad's former yeah, roommate's wife. Really? And we would visit her on the weekend, and sometimes she'd come home on the weekends. So, so yeah. you got your library or library science degree? Did you work in the library? Oh yeah, I was a children's librarian. And which one? Uh, well, I was in the, first I, I went to uh, South San Francisco, yeah. and then Daly City, and then to San Francisco, and I. You know, you tired from there, yeah. I was so total maybe because I did part time work, so total maybe thirteen years of library work. Yeah. Did you and Yoshi retire about the same time? Oh no 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 no. no. Because when I started the library school, he had already retired. Oh, so, what made you do it? Well, I had always wanted to be a, a librarian, and then and. And children's librarian, and he you know, people say, "Oh, don't be a children's librarian. They're so condescending and so on." And so, mm -hmm. you know, okay, you know. And then he was involved with his acting and everything, and he would go off to do rehearsals and everything like that. And then my brother died abruptly, and he was a librarian. Oh. And before he died, he left a, a letter saying, "Actually, you should have been the librarian in the family." Mm -hmm. Wow. And I said, "Okay," and so. Uh, when it came time and he was through with this particular uh, film, and I said, okay, now it's my turn. And so. That's great. What a great, good for you. I actually worked at the library too, so we worked in the same system. I was just a, you know, a page, but my oldest brother as well, so actually my Sochi's the only one who didn't work in the library, <laughs> in the library oh. system. <laughs> yeah, I want to I want to invite Soji to join us. Um, mm -hmm. And also, if Hi. anybody has any questions to ask, please put them in the chat. Happy to. Um, these, this is your chance to ask questions about Hiroshi. Soji. Hi, Soji. Yes. Hi, my mom. Hi, Hiroshi. <laughs> Soji, do you have any uh, memories of your dad that you'd like to share? Uh, he liked to eat lunch a lot. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I set the theme here. <laughs> um, so Kerwin, yeah, thank you to Kerwin for taking him out to lunch many times. I know they must have had some really nice, you know, conversations, and he probably knows things about my dad that um, none of us know. But, uh, and also thank you to Kerwin for um, making these films about my dad and really kind of um, bringing him back to life. Uh, and, you know, 
um, just seeing him again is really something um, that I'm grateful for. And to uh, Ben also for making those touching films um, about my dad and, and tailing him around and kind of like stalking him with his camera. <laughs> um, that, that, was, that was like, uh, I remember that. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, he's been gone since 2019. October and um, it, it really feels like he's still with me and with us uh, through you know films but just to sort of like a energy about it and every time Tule Lake comes up and you know they just had the, uh, the virtual Tule Lake pilgrimage and a couple weeks ago Hiroshi and I um, did a trip up to Tule Lake um, where I was interviewed for this TV show called uh, Black Files uh, Declassified. And uh, it was about government overreach and Tule Lake was an example of that. And so I was there as a descendant. Um, and I really felt like I was with, or my dad was with me um, while I was standing there uh, in Tule Lake, inside the jail. And yeah, so that that's kind of what I want to share at this time. Wow. Did he talk about it much when you were uh, a kid? Uh, Tule Lake? Yeah. He would always say Tule Lake is, is not my favorite topic to talk about. Yeah. And so um, when we were kids, I don't know, Hiroshi, I don't really remember him talking about Tule Lake that much. You know, like a lot of Sansei, my parents would talk about, they make this kind of cryptic reference to camp. Oh, that was during camp, and we didn't know what camp was. I mean, this is when we were really young, um, and so we would kept, kept hearing this reference to, to camp, and you know, we didn't exactly know what that meant. And it wasn't until, like, at the early 70s when my dad started um, coming out and talking about his experience, uh, did I understand uh, what happened, you know, to them? So, <clears throat> yeah. Soji, yeah. well, while we have you on, um, yeah. I, I think people know that you are a celebrated uh, playwright of your own, but, um, you know, your, your dad was as well. It's another one of his multifaceted talents. Seems like there was nothing he couldn't do um, do you want to talk about, could you talk about maybe, did he influence you at all? Or how did he, um, how did he lead you to uh, your path? Yeah, we used to, I, we had this really kind of unique um, uh, upbringing when we were pretty young. I was like 12 or 13. And my dad's plays were being done by the center players uh, the Center for Japanese American Studies out of San Francisco um, formed this group called the Center Players, and they were doing my dad's plays. And so we, everyone in the family got involved in some way. Uh, I remember playing a cabinet in one of his plays and just <laughs> handed stuff off to people as they came by. It was in camp. Um, and, uh, you know, and so my brothers would do voiceover work, or my younger brother, Hiroshi, actually acted he was one of the leading characters um uh, in one of the plays and so um we had this kind of unique experience of going on a bus and going to these small towns uh and presenting these plays and i remember um in berkeley um there was a performance and there were the east say these east say women sitting in the front row and uh I was sitting near the front, I was watching them and they were really just having a great time. And they, they, but it was a full range of emotions. They were laughing and they were crying. And by the end, they just, you know, had a wonderful time. And I remember thinking I was 13 that, you know, this is something that I wanted to do, you know, that I wanted to have this kind of effect on people. And so that was like, I guess the early, inspiration um which led me to 
do what I do now. So, yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. great. That's great. Um, again, if anybody has any questions for our esteemed guests, please put them in the chat and Jill will let us know. So there's a comment um, in response to the Tilly Light um, documentary, Jen. And this is from um, John Oda, Ota. I was on the 1975 student pilgrimage to Tilly Light. It was more like a 14 to 15 hour bus ride. We left UC Berkeley around 3 or 4 p.m. after the bus from San Francisco State joined us, then went to UC Davis, where a bus from Sacramento and UC Davis joined our caravan. Because we were students on a budget, we had a very basic e-mobile bus, no bathrooms on board, and it kept overheating on the incline by Shasta. So the bus had to keep pulling over to the side of the road to cool down. We finally reached the fairgrounds at Tulu Lake around 6 p.m., oh, 6 a.m. the following morning. We were so moved and totally in awe when Hiroshi pulled out the scrap of paper and read the poem he had composed on the bus ride up. It really captured our shared feeling of participating in the pilgrimage. Wow. Great story. Yeah, yeah. thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, that that is kind of amazing. He no, wrote. No, actually, oh. it says Mari wrote that. Sorry. So it was Mari. Oh, oh. thanks, Mari. <laughs> From John. <Martin>. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Mari. Um, he he wrote a meeting at Tule Lake on the bus. Wow. And after I went to the next one, and I remember being at the, uh, sleeping on the floor at camp. Right? And it was after that I think uh, um, the nurses group took over and started go to, going to uh, OT. Uh, OIT. OIT. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and accommodations were, were more suitable than, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we had both beds and stuff like that, but yeah. Wow. Ben, what did you, what did you get out of um, stalking? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not really stalking if you have permission. <laughs> so, well, um, other than other than Hiroshi like to eat, um, uh, I, I got a sense he knew a lot of people. Um, even though he wouldn't, he didn't want any of them to talk to me. He knew a lot of people. Uh, so, uh, uh, I guess some of the things. I went on the pilgrimage in 2016. That's where the, the uh, photos of him on the bus come from. So I, I was there uh, on the bus uh, and got to meet George Takei as part of it. And that's, um, I almost got to interview George, except I, I made a mistake on my part and not just interviewing him right away. I wanted to do it later and can't ever get on George's schedule. So I moved that one, but I was able at least to capture George's intro to Hiroshi when he was, uh, uh, when Hiroshi gave uh, readings uh, on the next and last day of the program. Uh, and I'm not sure I answered your question. Well, I mean, did you, did you uh, have good talks? Did you learn a lot from him? Did you? Well, one of the things I wanted to do when I interviewed him was for him to talk about things that he hadn't written about. To um, um, so like the, the the artist, he never. There may be some references to um, drawings that he's done, but he's never never talked about, mm -hmm. not in detail about his artistry. And I wanted to explore that. Um, uh, and I, I didn't want to tell, I wanted to try not to tell stories that somebody else had told. I wanted to try and not tell them with, with a similar, similar story, not to tell them in the same tone. Because you can find videos out there on YouTube of Hiroshi reading a, um, a meeting of two of you, right? And he's angry. It's shown as an angry thing. And I didn't know Hiroshi was angry at all. Uh, in fact, in, 
um, in one of his in one of his um, public readings, he's asked, "Why aren't you angry?" And Hiroshi starts laughing. And he said, "Well, I can be angry, but it takes a lot of energy to be angry." Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do was show Hiroshi not angry, and um, actually I wanted to show him. Uh, never got to this point, but to show him uh, in the areas where he had been, like where where did he live before he mm -hmm. uh, lived near the beach? And we talked about that a little bit, but we never got to the point of actually you know, going there and filming that, because he he would talk about it when his, when his sons were little. They had a a place, and it was a walk up, I think, by the park, from from the street. So, um, and I got a, there's a few scenes of him in the library um, where he's actually doing a reading of Ocean Beach to Koto. Actually, I, that that happened by accident because uh, we had a uh, that day because of Infinity and Trashy Rama, we had a, um, a screening at senior center somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about and <laughs> somehow that day I was a chauffeur <laughs> because I got to drive their car. I drove them to the, uh, the screening and then the next thing I drove them to the Western Edition Library where Hiroshi did the reading. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, you need a chauffeur in there. We have a question from Pam Matsuoka. She asks, can Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Can you talk about the books that you wrote starting in about 1991, going on for the next 13 years? This is how I learned the most about Hiroshima Pam. 1999, which book was that? I think so. Um, hi, oh, that was I'm Mondo. That book was Mondo. But swimming was first. Swimming was his first one, though. Um, personal one. Yeah. Yeah, does anyone have anything to say about um, Hiroshi as a writer, as an author? Well, I, I, you know, he, before segregation, he was in a, an art group at, in camp, and he had written to space, and he was the only non, the others are all the college graduates, or had at least one year, year of college. And so he just, you know, wrote this piece, and he read it, and dead silence, no one said anything, and he got really discouraged. He thought, okay, they don't like it. So he destroyed the piece. Oh. And so a little later, the, the leader of the group you know, came to him and said, uh, well, do you have that piece? No, I thought you didn't like it, so I destroyed it. So my point being is, if you really like something, say so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, does anybody else have questions? Um, I had one question from Hiroshi. So we haven't talked a whole lot about um, your your dad as an actor. Is that something he always, it seems like he's, he'd been acting since fairly young. Uh, and did you get that bug from him? Oh, <laughs> I just did it once. Oh. <laughs> I think it was so challenging for our whole family that we <laughs> never did that. <laughs> he did a good job, actually. <laughs> I think it was too stressful for everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I think my dad had the, the acting book very, very young, um, but he didn't really pursue it. There wasn't, you know, there weren't opportunities for Asian actors. You know, even now it's it's pretty scarce. And but he really enjoyed it. I think he was a rather a natural. Um, and I think. I seem to recall having a conversation with him maybe a couple of years back and 
if he had any regret, I think it was that he didn't pursue acting. But, you know, he, he did pretty good. I mean, Chrome is using this 95 year old guy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just a couple of years ago. Yeah, he has. Yeah. He just had this natural screen presence and this yeah. charisma oh, okay, was amazing. Mm -hmm. One one memory I have is from the 2018 pilgrimage, and he was getting kind of old. He was walking with a stick. He wouldn't use a cane, so he used a stick, and you know he's having trouble breathing mm -hmm. a little bit, and so he always read at their. Um, the last event of the pilgrimage. And that night, I was like, oh man, I hope he does okay, you know, because he's just seemed tired. But it's like he's an actor. Oh, and when he got in front of us, yeah, and I'm like, oh, he was pretty damn good. Yeah. And he was <laughs> impressive. You know, if it wasn't, if he wasn't my dad, I'd be impressed. I mean, I was <laughs> stuff that he's done like when he passed there's all these you know things about his life and he's a pretty impressive guy and i think for my brother and i it was kind of like mm, you know that's dad you know <laughs> and it kind of got to be a little matter of fact like oh he's on the news okay well he's gonna go to the white house oh, okay <laughs> yeah. doesn't everyone's dad do that no <laughs> Okay, so we screened ICR at at the AMC Theater in Japan Town, a huge auditorium, and we were making all sorts of calls. And David Chu, who was the supervisor at the time, uh, is a friend of a friend of mine. He gave Hiroshi his, his certificate, you know, and uh, so he comes up there. So years later, like uh, we got dinner with Hiroshi and Sadako, and uh, we went over to their house and had ice cream afterwards. And I'm looking on the wall, and there's like three of them. It was literally the same plaque that had been to so many uh, presentations and, and uh, award ceremonies. If the city had given him three of the same one, it was just kind of like, okay. <laughs> pretty funny. Wasn't there a story where he was supposed to, he couldn't, he couldn't go to something because he was going to the White House? Um, okay, so there's two stories about it. So Hiroshi's like, is a theater guy and theater guys like live and die to be on stage and it's a different kind of acting than, than film and you really project so like um when he's not um he's not like on stage he's, he's a really pretty chill guy you know he's just you know you wouldn't suspect he's just, you know, an actor an orator and uh, when he gets up on stage it's just like, you know, it, it's amazing to see the transformation. And um, yeah, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Uh, so we were doing the table read for ICR. Is it table read for ICR? Um, and he writes through this email that he, he can't come because he's going to the White House. And um, it was just like, okay. But he was like being really apologetic about it. Being very Japanese about, it. I'm sorry I can't make this, but I, have, you know, I want to go to the White House and meet Michelle Obama. Um, he was just like, he was so Japanese because he kept apologizing. I just said, like, dude, I wouldn't go if I was going to the White House. I wouldn't go to my own film. Um, and then years, so one more story about him being a trooper and then about about theater and performances. We were we were showing on Bainbridge Island. And I get this call like the week going into the show, and, and I think it was from Sadako. She goes, "Up, uh, Roshi's had a. Uh, I'm not sure exact something happened physically, and, and uh, you know he wasn't going to be able to make it to the show." And I'm like, "Of course, yeah. You don't need to come to this. It's like, you know, your health should be the priority. Don't please don't even think about it. Next time I see him, it's on the ferry to Bainbridge Island." So it's like, oh, like, dude, you came up here, you know, like the show must go on thing. And I'm just like, wow. Um, so he comes to that and we screen both at Bainbridge and then at the, the Wing Luke. And he, that's one of the uh, 
performances. One of the readings had been caught on his, his documentary. So he had like had a, I, I'm not sure what happened to him, but maybe a heart attack or something. And it was just I like- I had a gout attack. A gout attack. And it was just no. like, I was stunned. He, and it was just like, you know, it was, and it, he loved acting so much. And it was just like, the show must go on kind of thing. It's just like. I remember when I first met Peter, she got to the lake. And he was telling me about um, what he did in camp. And he was talking about doing skits and, I don't know, stand up comedy and things. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I don't remember seeing you because I was eight. Yeah. And, ten. <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't going to. <laughs> But I remember he would like light up when he was talking about acting. Mm -hmm. And then in yeah, Cohen's films, the same thing happens. He's yeah. acting and you know, suddenly it's all a glow. Yeah. Great. I think didn't he uh this was after he retired or when right about when he retired, he was cast in Philip Gotanda's The Wash. Right? Mm -hmm. Whose idea was that? I mean, do you remember anything about how he got that part? I think it was Phil's idea, right? Yeah. That, that's why he retired early. To be an actor. To be in the to wash. Be in the wash. Oh, to be in the wash. Yeah. And he played the lead? He played the husband? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Man. Yeah, he, he wanted to play the lead in the movie, but it had been promised to Marco. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so he didn't get the right. Oh, too bad. I mean, although Mako was, was great in the, the yeah. movie, but... I have a story about the White House. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, that was uh, March 11th of that year, and there was that uh, earthquake in, in uh, the Kyoto area and so forth. So, and I was supposed to go to this event in Kyoto, and the 750th, uh, it was a Buddhist uh, Women's Association, but because of that, I, I canceled, you know, I was the earthquake. And so I said, okay, you know, March 11th, so be it kind of thing. I was kind of regret, and I got, you know, credit and all that. And so then I get this call and I, and it says, this is the White House. I'm going, oh yeah, right. <laughs> 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 and it was, Colin said, are you available on March 11th? I said, and so check with Tito. She and he says, yeah. And so, he said, I said, why? He says, well, there's, it, uh, April was, or is um, poetry, you know, uh, National Poetry uh, Month. And we're having an event with poets. And we were wondering if you could make it. And I said, okay, well, we'll clear your, you know, I, a calendar and everything, you know, we we'll wait for your call. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And I mean, it really taxed our patience. Wow. And so we finally got the call saying, you know, and of course we had to pay our own way and, you know, and everything. And, but it was a worth the experience. And, and we went, to, uh, oh, and then another thing, I was scheduled to be in LA for one of Soji's events following the weekend. And so anyway, I go, you know, we go to uh, Washington and then on the way back, we just kind of, instead of coming home to uh, Berkeley, I mean, to San Francisco, we went out to LA, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that was quite an experience. Oh, did you buy a dress just for the- Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, how was that? What was that experience like, shaking a president's hand? Well, he had some connections, so he he uh, spoke at the Howard University, mm -hmm. and or not at Howard, but at at, at the um, bookstore close to Howard. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, and uh, so that was very interesting, and then. Um, of the security, he had to go to security, oh. and uh, 
it was yeah, it was quite an experience. And we had we had a chance to go tour because we had, we had some time, so we had a chance to tour, and we went to the Native American Museum had just opened up, so we saw that, and we went to the Smithsonian, and I'm just, we didn't make it to to um, Arlington. I'm sorry that I, I mean. If I were to go back, I'd like to go to Arlington. Mm -hmm. But you know, we got on the 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 right the, the transit and everything. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, it was very interesting. Oh, oh. Do you remember if the sakura trees were in bloom? Pardon? Do you remember if the cherry blossoms were in bloom? Uh, no, not at that time. I think we were a little earlier, a little late. Yeah. Uh, so Mari Matsumoto has a, a comment about the commission here. Mari, do you want to unmute and share your comment? Oh, yeah, I just remember when Hiroshi testified before the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, and he used his voice and his dramatic skills to because people were just kind of, you know, he was reading, but people, his narrative was so compelling. It was just the way he said it, that he just held the commissioners in thrall. And, you know, that was in the Golden Gate um, University. I don't know, it's one of their big lecture halls and it was packed with mostly Japanese Americans listening. And it was just silent, you know, listening to him speak. And his voice just kind of filled the room and, it's just the way he said that it was just so spellbinding that that I remember there there are some some testimonies really stood out and his was one of them that um, it was the way he delivered it that that was just really um, just made the commissioners sit up and really listen and pay attention to so yeah yeah he 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 said that he purposely glared at the commissioners and <laughs> no traffic no. you know. So. Yeah, drives down from roads to shoot films. I cannot complain. <laughs> I cannot complain about it. We have one more comment from Grace Morizawa. She says, "I once saw Hiroshi walk into a high school room of three classes. The moment he entered, they stood and cheered that he was a rock star. Oh. They had read his work and his appearance meant a lot to them." Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Grace. Um, okay, any other last thoughts? I encourage you to unmute yourself if you want to make any 